way, way back. Let's, uh, let's prepare our hearts. Let's prepare our hearts. I love that song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, I want to see you. Oh, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Oh, I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing, holy, 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 you are holy, 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 I want to see you. Lord Jesus, you are the Holy One. You are awesome. You are seated on the throne of God in heaven above. And we praise you that you haven't left us as orphans. We praise you that you've given your Holy Spirit to us. And so even now, Lord, we invite you and we welcome you. And we ask that you would come. You said, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Lord, we draw near. I pray for us as your congregation this morning that you would give us eyes to hear you, eyes to see you, ears to hear you, minds to know you, and hearts to understand who you are and who you're calling us to be. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, brothers and sisters, it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Raise your hand if you're glad to be in church. Woo! Raise two hands if you're glad church these days have air conditioning. Hey, I remember when I was a kid, right? You, you know what you had to do when it was a hot day? Hope the exhaust fan or the ceilings fan were running. And your last case was you take that bulletin, right? Does anyone remember popsicle stick fans? You would glue something on it, right? You remember that? God, thank you for air conditioning. Thank you for all these things. So, um, so this morning, I have the privilege of kind of doing double duty. I get to share the word. Pastor Bob and his family, they're visiting family down in Alabama. And so, Pastor Bob, we love you. Uh, may the Lord bless your time away this summer. But I'll be, I'll be sharing the word. But I wanted to begin with, um, with a question. I wanted to begin by, by kind of looking back, echoing back. Do you remember the first time you felt the first time you experienced, the first time you could like tangibly know the love of God. Do you remember that? you remember that first time? It was like maybe you grew up and you heard about God. You would go to Sunday school or you would go to vacation Bible school and, and you would believe, you would trust. But that first time where like the hairs on your arms stood up, that first time you knew that you knew, that you knew not only was God real, of course he is, but that God loves you. You knew it. You knew, he's like, oh, he deeply loves me. I remember one of the first times I experienced that. I was a sophomore in high school, and uh, during the summer, actually, there was a gathering at a college, and we were there, and we were singing worship and praise, and I wasn't expecting anything, and I had faith. I loved Jesus, but I wasn't sold out for the Lord. I wasn't all in. I had, you know, my parents were believers, me and my sisters, we were believers, but, but I didn't think much about it until one day something very important happened. It was a summer day, kind of like this. It was in the evening, and we were gathering, and we were singing a song. And they were playing a song where the chorus went like this. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. Then it went, it went on and it did. I want to touch you. I want to see your face. I want to know you more. And when we were singing that, something very interesting happened to me. I began to feel like an ache in my stomach. And when we were singing that, I thought, yeah, I do, Lord. I want that. I want to I wanna hear you. I want to actually see you. I want to know you. And we kept singing the song, and that ache grew and grew and actually began to hurt. 
in my stomach, and I began to feel a desperation, like, God, I really want to know you. I need to know you. I need to hear you. I need to see your face. And that desperation grew and grew and grew, and finally it felt like, I'm going to explode, God, if you don't show yourself to me. And then all of a sudden, like a river, like a waterfall, I felt the deep, deep love of Jesus wash over me from my head to my feet and I felt the Lord say Chris I love you and I knew it I knew that he did and I felt Lord I love you too and from that moment when I was in high school I knew I couldn't be the same after that I knew everything I had everything I was gonna do all that I am, everything that made me, me, belonged to the living God who loved me so much that I couldn't help but love him back. Last week, we enjoyed Father's Day. We heard about the Father's love, and I want to continue on that theme this Sunday as we are going to hear what it means to be loved by God the Father. And my prayer for us this morning is that we would know deeply two things. One, that we would know deeply the love of God the Father for us personally. And two, that we would begin to understand that that desperate love God has for us, he also has for our lost, broken brothers, sisters, children who are far from God. As desperately as he loves us, he desperately loves those who are missing from his house, from his kingdom. I already prayed, but I want to pray a second time. Let me pray again. <laughs> Father, we love you. And I do pray that you would bless the reading, hearing, preaching of your word this morning. And Lord Jesus, I pray that your finger would reach down and touch our hearts today. May your people know that we are loved by God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. And let's go to Luke, chapter 15. We're going to read verses 11 through 32. Luke 15, 11 through 32. As we, as we share, let me uh, give us a little bit of context for the passage before we read it. So Luke, chapter 15, there's a couple stories ahead of this story, all right? Now, now, the context, what's happening, Jesus was eating and a bunch of tax collectors and sinners were gathering to be where Jesus was. And when they were gathering to Jesus, some of the Pharisees, some of the teachers of the law began muttering. You know what muttering is? It's when you kind of grumble and complain, right? Oh boy, oh brother, what's going on? Right? They started muttering to themselves and they're saying, this guy eats with sinners and welcomes them. Who does that, right? We're supposed to be holy. We're supposed to be pure. We're supposed to be separate from the sinners and the tax collectors and, and the rebels. And Jesus, here he is saying, come on, let's eat together. Well, Jesus, understanding what they were mumbling and grumbling about, began to share some stories with them. The first, he says, now listen, right? Think about a shepherd, all right? A shepherd goes out. Doesn't a shepherd lead the 99 sheep in the open field, leaves them there to go seek after what? The one. The one. The one lost sheep. And when he finds them, what does he do? Joyfully, joyfully picks up the sheep, puts it on his shoulders, brings it back home, and says to his friends and neighbors, come celebrate with me. I found my lost sheep. Jesus says, in the same way, I tell you, there is more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who didn't need to. God loves the lost. God loves the lost. He goes on, he says a second story. He says, or it's like a woman, okay, who has 10 coins and she loses one of those very valuable coins 
What does she do? She lights a lamp, right? Light the lamp so you can see. And she searches carefully for that lost coin until she finds it. And when she finds the lost coin, goes and says to her friends and neighbors, come celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Jesus says, I tell you, there's more rejoicing before the angels in heaven over one person who repents one person who comes back to God, one person who is found. And then Jesus goes to share a third story. In the Bible, when you see something, a theme repeated three times, it means this is really important. This gives you a clear picture about a truth of the living God. And the third story he shares is what we're going to read now. Now, this passage has been called The Prodigal Son. But I want to change the title. I want to share, suggest a different title. I want to say this is the parable of the Father's love. Let's read it this morning. Luke 15, verses 11 through 32. Hear the word of the Lord. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating. But no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This is the word of the Lord to us this morning. Thanks be to God. It's an amazing passage of scripture, isn't it? It's a familiar story, but it's a profound, beautiful story. It sets up with a family, right? You've got the father of an estate. This is a wealthy landowner. Think of Downton Abbey, all right? You've got, you've got servants, you've got farmers, you've got tenants, you've got all this stuff. 
And then you have the children, all right? And there are two sons, an older brother and a younger brother. Well, the conflict comes when one day, right, the, the, the setting is placed, the younger son goes to the father and says, I want my inheritance right now, right? Give me what's coming to me. That's like saying, Dad, I wish you were dead <laughs> because I want what you have, and I want to use it how I want to use it. Shockingly, the father does what he asks. He divides his property, and he gives, he gives what is coming, right? When, when he would have passed away and, and rightfully passed on the inheritance, he gives ahead of time to the younger son what would have been his, all the property, all the money, all the possessions. It's an incredible thing. Why would the father do that? That's a question. Right? Why would the father honor a very rude, painful thing, right? It doesn't say, I don't know, but it says something to how God, our Father, lets us make our own choices, doesn't he? Even when it's bad decisions, right? If we ask for it, he honors that freedom. It's an incredible thing. And so the story goes, right? The son, he's rich now. He's got, he's got all the money, but he goes off and he begins to waste it all, right? He squanders this incredible inheritance on, on riotous, wild living. Well, this younger son soon learns a lesson. Riches do not endure forever, like it says in Proverbs, right? And pretty soon the money's gone. Oh, no. But just then, right, when, when all this inheritance has been wasted and used up, hard times hit. Something much bigger than the son's personal stories going on. A famine hits the whole land. Everyone's going to suffer. Everyone's affected by it. There's a severe famine, and all of a sudden, this younger son who ran from home, he's in trouble. What's he going to do? And so he gets, he gets a job, right? Well, it's worse than a job. He hires himself. He sells himself, all right? And becomes a hired hand, not to someone from his country, but in this foreign, distant country. And he begins his job. He's going to feed the pigs. All right? He's, he's doing the slop, doing the pods for the pigs. Understand the context, all right? To the Jewish people, to the people of Israel, with the covenant and the food laws, there is nothing more degrading than being around pigs or other unclean animals. He wasn't even allowed to eat the pig. And look at this. Now he's got to serve the pig his food. Couldn't be learned. You can't, you can't get lower than that if you're, if you're from Israel, if you're a Jewish person, right? And yet he was so desperate when he was feeding the pigs in this degrading way, he said, I wish I could eat those scraps. I'm starving. Oh, could I have some? Could I have some? No. Nobody gave him anything. Even the pigs, these unclean animals, were eating better than he was. And then finally, it just hits on him. It hits him. He comes to his senses. He's like, oh my goodness. I know back home, when people hire themselves out to my father, they eat way better than this. They're taken, they're taken care of in my father's house, not even the family, just, just the hired hands. He says, if I keep living this way, I'm going to die. I think it scared him. I think he realized the decisions of my life are leading me literally to death. I'm going to die. And he thinks about it, and he said, I only have one hope. There's just one chance for me. I need to go back home. I need to go back to my father's house. But how could he do it? How shameful he was to his father. It's like spitting in his face, right? I wish you were dead, he basically says by saying, give me my inheritance. But he has to. He's going to die. And so he thinks of what he's going to say, right? He says, okay, I'm going to say this. He's going to say, father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Because of what I've done, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So, so don't, I don't come here pretending to be your son. Just make me like one of your hired hands. Make me a servant in your house. So he thinks, well, maybe that'll work. And so he starts home. <clears throat> and so he's on his way home, and I imagine he's rehearsing the words. But just before he gets home, something extraordinary happens. <laughs> You see, his father was at home. 
And his father saw him out in the distance. When he was far off, that implies the father's been watching and waiting for his lost son to just come home. And when the father saw him, it says he was filled with compassion. His father wasn't filled with disappointment, wasn't filled with anger, wasn't filled with, you've got to be kidding me, was filled with love, with compassion. And the father runs out to meet his son. And he runs out, arms open wide, and he grabs his son. And he embraces him, and he kisses him, just pouring out his love. I imagine the son's like, what is happening? So he defaults to his plan. He says, okay, okay, okay. Father, and he starts to say his plan, I have sinned against heaven and against you. He confesses the wrong he did, not only to his father, but to heaven above, right? To to the Lord. I've sinned against heaven and against you. He says, I'm no longer worthy because of what I've done. I don't deserve to be your son. I don't deserve to be your child. Father, would you hire me? Right? Could, Could you make me like one of your hired hands? Well, before he can finish the speech, Before he even gets to the point of selling himself back, the father stops him. He says something extraordinary. He says, quick, right now, bring a robe and put it on him. He says, quick, get a ring and put it on his finger. The family ring means you're going to do family business. That's the seal. He's, He's like immediately restored to work, to do the business of the family. Get sandals, put it on his feet, and we got to celebrate. Let's kill the fattened calf and celebrate. Why? Why is the father celebrating? Because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. (laughs) To be away from the father is to be dead. To come back to the father is to be alive again. He was lost and is found, restored, just like that. Before he could demonstrate, before he could do a probationary period and really say, no, really, I'm going to live like your son, before any of that, as soon as he comes to the Father, as soon as he confesses, he's restored. He's back to sonship in the Father's house. And it's an extraordinary story. But that's not the end of the story, is it? Wait a minute, wait a minute. You see, there's the older brother. There's the brother who never left. There's the brother who stayed faithfully in the father's house and worked and toiled day and night while his little brother was a fool and and was killing himself and wasting all the family inheritance. And the older brother says, what's going on? What's all this ruckus? What's all this noise that I'm hearing? And the other people say, your brother came home and your father killed the fattened calf for him. Well, the brother didn't like that very much. And the brother stayed outside. He didn't go to the feast, didn't go to the party. What does that mean? It means when he heard the father received his brother, the brother did not. That's a refusal to forgive and receive his brother back. But that's not the end of the story either. Isn't that good? There's still hope for the brothers and their relationship brother to brother. Because the father comes out of the party, and he goes, and he says, come in. He pleads with him, right? It's, it's an invitation. The father's reaction is the same to the lost and the found. Come into my house, right? Come. He pleads with them, and he says, look, we had to celebrate because not only this son of mine, listen, this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost, and now he's found. Amen. Truly, he taught us to love one another. Well, the story ends on a cliffhanger. What's the older brother going to do? Is he going to forgive? Is he going to go? Is he going to receive? Or is he going to choose to ironically do what the younger son did in his rebellion and leave? We don't know. The story doesn't end. There's a whole lot (laughs) we can glean from these powerful words of Jesus, our Lord, today. 
But over these next few moments this morning, there are only three simple truths I'd like to share based off our passage from today. The first is this. Number one, church, you are loved by God. God loves you deeply from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. God loves you. You need to understand today that not one of us was born by mistake. We are here on purpose for his purpose. We were fearfully and wonderfully made. While we were in our mother's womb, he was knitting us and stitching us together. God deeply loved us. I've heard someone say before, the love of God is like a birthday. I love birthdays, all right? Why? Because when you celebrate a birthday, you're actually not celebrating an achievement, right? Oh, you did it. You graduated. Or, or man, you, you won the game. Here's a trophy, right? You're not celebrating because of anything somebody else did. We celebrate birthdays. Why? Just because you are. Because you exist. Because you were born. That's worthy of celebrating. God's love is like a birthday, you can't earn it. You can't, you can't achieve it. It just is. You are children of God, dearly loved by him. No mistakes. You know, it's been said that the value of an object is determined by the price somebody's willing to pay for it. Look at markets. What, what causes it? Whatever someone's willing to pay. So how valuable are you to God? God the Father sent the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die upon the cross and shed his precious blood for you and for me and for your children who don't know or love God right now and for your friends and for all the lost among us. That's how valuable and precious each one of us is. He paid his own life. For the joy set before him, it says, Jesus endured the cross, scorning its saying. While we were still sinners, Christ loved us. He died for us. Number one, foundationally understand the deep, deep love of Jesus. His love for you is deep, wide, long, and high. But this brings me to the second point that I want to share today. Like the younger brother, we're all prone to wander. You know, there's that part of the song, Come Thou Fount. I love that verse where it says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. The tragedy of the human experience is that we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Every person who's ever lived knows, you don't have to convince somebody, that we've got a magnet towards destruction, towards doing what is wrong, towards leaving the God we love. It's a disposition of the heart that goes back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve broke the command, broke the good ways of God, and sin entered the world. Ever since that day, everyone who was ever born has a heart that's drawn like a magnet away from God. But... But there's good news this morning. God who created you, God who loved you, God who fully understands the truth that we leave him, that we run from him, his love for us never changes. Number three, even when we run from God, even when we reject the Lord and say, just let me enjoy the things of this world now without you, and we go far from God, even still, God loves us. And his love for us remains unchanged. 
Think about the story we just heard, the passage of Scripture. When that younger brother comes, how does he find his father? Does he find him like this? You got some explaining to do. Hey, where were you? How could you do this? Don't you know the devastation you caused to your family when you ran and hurt us like this? The father's arms were not crossed. Body language matters. How does he find the father? Running. 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 My dear friends, even when you are far from the God who loves you and your back is turned from him, he is watching and waiting and running to meet you and restore you. And if you think that's good, even when our children or our parents or our brothers and our sisters or our friends are running, spitting at the Lord, his posture toward them, Everything we need to know about the heart of God, you can observe in the posture of the cross. What's the posture of the cross? It's not like this. His love is wide enough to receive everyone who comes to him. And his love is deep enough to restore even the most broken of sinners. It's wide, it's deep, it's deep, and it's wide. You, we, our families, our cities, our nations are never too far gone that the love of God cannot sweep us up find us and bring us back and restore us into our Father's house that we who were lost and we who were dead might again become children of God. I want to close this morning by reading a children's story. This is a book my parents used to read to us when we were kids, and I love it. It's called I Love You Forever, and it illustrates the kind of unfailing love God has for us. Let's hear this today. I think we might have pictures up there. All right, we do. A mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, the baby grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was two years old, and he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves. He pulled all the food out of the refrigerator, and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. Bethany, this book resonates more and more every time we read it. <laughs> this kid's driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when that two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, the little boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old. And he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath. And when grandma visited, he always said bad words. Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. <laughs> but at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, 
crawled across the floor and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, the boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. He had strange friends and he wore strange clothes and he listened to strange music. Sometimes his mother felt like she was in a zoo. <laughs> but at nighttime, when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he really was asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that teenager grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town. But sometimes on dark nights, the mother got into her car and drove across town. If all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened her bedroom window, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of his bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. And one day she called up her son and said, you'd better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So her son came to see her. And when he came in the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I love you forever, I like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and sick. The son went back to his mother. He picked her up and rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he sang this song. I love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. When the sun came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs. Then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I love you forever, I like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The Lord your God loves you. And as long as God the Father is God, and that is forever, He will still love you. The question is, will we receive it? Will we love Him back? 
And will we love one another with that kind of love God has toward us? Whether someone's coming or going, will we love one another as God loves us? Let us pray. As we pray, I want to invite us to take a posture of response. I'm going to pray for us, and I want to invite us, just where you're at, if you want to receive, if you want to receive the love of God, just open your hands. Just open your hands, palms facing up. I want to pray for us. Father in heaven, thank you that you love us. Thank you that when we were still sinners, you sent Jesus to die for us. It was my sin, it was my brokenness that nailed him there. And still he died for the iniquity of us all. And you raised him from the dead. Our hope is in your life. Father in heaven, we receive your love. We say yes, Lord. We accept it. Father, for those of us who have been straying, maybe straying a little bit, maybe straying a lot, we come to you. We come back to you. And we say, Father, bring us back home. We receive your love in Jesus' name. We say, yes, Lord. Father, you know that in this holy place this morning, in this sanctuary, you know that we are burdened by loved ones who are far from you. We have parents, we have children, we have friends, we have brothers and sisters who are living as if they're dead, living lost from God the Father. We call on the name of the Lord some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so, Father, in Jesus' name, we call to you and we say, run to our children. Lord, would you see them? Would you see where they are? And would you run to them? Run to our friends run to our family, run to our neighbors. Would you see them and filled with compassion, run out into the road and meet them so that they too can be restored as children of God. We worship you and we thank you that your love endures forever. And Lord, we want to say we love you back. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's children said, Amen.